number of Airbnb uh, listings surged during the pandemic as people are working from home. They th think they can move out to the countryside and enjoy the fresh air and buy a vacation house. And now they are experiencing this reckoning of a collapse in, you know, uh, short term rental. Uh, Was this uh, recently, Anna? This year, it started this year, but okay. the data are really coming in now that it shows that this um, massive decrease in bookings is happening all along these cities like Colorado, uh, South Carolina, Sunbelt cities. And so I, I think that there is a second wave of housing correction happening with the second tier, third tier cities. Where And these are the cities also that have booming employment during the pandemic with, you know, sub four, sub three unemployment rate. I think the, the um, you know, the reckoning is coming for these cities and we that's the driver. Anna Wan joins us today. She is the chief U.S. economist for Bloomberg Economics, who prior to joining Bloomberg, worked as an economist at the Federal Reserve, the Council of Economic Advisors of the White House and the U.S. Treasury. Anna, welcome to the show. Glad to see you. Happy to be here, David. I want to bring up some stats that uh, came in recently. So first, the uh, Citigroup Economic Surprise Index has been trending up. And what this essentially means is that the data that's been coming out has been beating expectations. Now, uh, this could mean that either expectations have been too low or that there has been uh, pockets of strength in the economy that um, are giving people a little bit more hope. Uh, which is it, you think? Yeah, so that index is constructed um, as, you know, actual data minus uh, some kind of median ex consensus expectations, right? I think a lot of it is exactly um, that expectations were too low. If you look at the actual data, the overall data is still suggesting that the momentum of economic activity is still moderating and slowing down. But you know, if you look at the index, you see that that upward surprises even started around, uh, it even happened around the March SVB collapse when, when the entire banking sector was in turmoil and there were just a lot of bearish calls. But even then, you, you see these these uh, surprises marching up. It tells me that a lot of it is um, very low uh, expectations. And, and while it's true that the, uh, the economy has been more resilient than thought, it doesn't tell you uh, by that measure alone that the economy is booming, right? It's still going, it's still moderating. Right. Uh, many people are concerned about a recession and more specifically whether or not the labor market will deteriorate because whether or not a recession really hits people is um, dependent on whether or not their jobs are affected. And so your, your base case is to call for unemployment to tick up uh, to above 4%, um, I believe 4.3 or 4.4%. Can you tell us about uh, how you came to that conclusion? Yeah, so so you know, uh, recently, given the strength of labor, the labor market, a lot of people think that um, unemployment rate cannot possibly go above four percent. And our starting analysis is by looking at you know past uh, economic cycles on the eaves of recessions, right? Right, like, uh, and and what is the uh, fees statistically? What is the feasible unemployment rate from now? to you know end of the year and um the, these um historical pattern tells us that if a recession does begin in september uh this year our model uh, we have a threshold recession model and that's spiking in terms of recession chances around september so if a recession does happen in september then historical patterns of non-farm payroll is such that a 4.1% unemployment rate is in the fourth quarter of this year is entirely consistent with historical pattern. So our baseline for 4.3% unemployment uh, assumes that the labor market would weaken more so than um, in a traditional you know, uh, recession environment. And, and that, that is because we think that the recession will be just slightly um, deeper than the average recession. Okay. And in terms of uh, which sectors would be impacted, have you done any analysis on uh, the um, industries that would see the most layoffs? You know, typically in a recession, it is the leisure retail sectors that see the most amount of layoffs. But in this economic cycle, we have seen several very unique aspects that's, that differs from this historical pattern. First of all, the retail leisure sectors are the sector that 
is most understaffed and experienced the highest labor shortage during the pandemic. And also it is the sector that's most benefiting from the opening up uh, since COVID where people are, you know, reallocating their their money from buying goods to services. People are traveling, going out and eating. So you see very little signs of weakness in these uh, sectors, which traditionally would see the would lead layoffs. Another sector which traditionally lead in the layoffs are um, construction sectors and manufacturing sectors. And construction sector also we saw um, we saw a couple of months of negative non-farm. Uh, payroll change in construction as the residential housing sector saw started a downturn last year in the U.S. But lately, we're already seeing signs of stabilization. And in fact, I think the most compelling argument for why there won't be a recession in the U.S., that the Fed will succeed in threading that needle of getting a soft landing, is construction in this area of construction. So Biden's signature policies, CHIPS Act, Inflation Reduction Act, and Infrastructure Bill, all these actually generated a massive demand for construction workers. And we estimate that, you know, just uh, from these industrial, po- these industrial policy would boost construction employment by almost 400K just this year. So that to me is the most compelling argument for why there, um, you know, you, we could avoid a recession. Okay, so but so going back to why we we still think that there is a recession. Well, that's because um, the number one factor that's creating these resi- this resilience in the U.S. economy has been excess savings held by household. You know, during the pandemic, we we got three rounds of fiscal stimulus, and each round passed on uh, checks to households. And even after these three rounds of fiscal stimulus, individual states such as California, for example, have also these additional uh, been sending additional checks to households. So, in fact, during the pandemic, households receive multiple rounds of uh, paychecks. And even for myself, I'm based in Virginia. I received a $500 check from the Virginia state government last year because the state has been running these surpluses as a result of the fiscal transfer from from, uh, federal government. So, you know, economists has estimated the stock of excess savings to be about, you know, between uh, 700 billion to even 1.5 trillion. Uh, And, if, it, if you believe in the upper end of this estimate, one point there's 1.5 trillion excess savings sitting in people's bank account, that would create about 12 months of runway for, you know, uh, uh, subsidized, sustaining people's spending habits without cutting into savings or cutting into having people to cut back on spending. But what we are seeing is that at the lower 40 percentile of the income distribution in US, those people have already run out of those excess savings. In fact, in real terms, inflation adjusting for the cash, uh, liquid cash balance sitting in their bank account, the bottom 40% poorest Americans long have run out. In fact, they're now worse off than before the pandemic. And you know, these people have higher uh, propensity to consume than wealthy people. So I, I see that in the second half of this year, these folks would be the reason for why we could have a recession. Like last, for the past two years, we thought that we won't have a recession because precisely these people are holding consumption up. But uh, that is about to change. Uh, just on the note on excess savings, uh, if I were to offer the counter argument that we as an economy generally do not want excess savings to be high, otherwise we'll end up like Japan, what would you say? <laughs> that's that's a very interesting observation. And I, I mean, I think that's one argument for why for a long time economists think that the neutral rate, our star in U.S. would be drifting lower. In fact, it has been drifting lower for the ten, past 10 years. That's why uh, long term treasury yields have been going down. And basically, uh, the financial world the economy has gotten used to a low interest rate environment 
because there's people are aging, people are uh, saving more than they invest in. So you have a you know environment of low interest rate. But I don't think we are. I think the the risks have changed since the pandemic. Um, I think during this pandemic, we've seen that the government has recognized the risk of having supply chains concentrated from ch in China. And also uh, there has been an accelerated transition towards green energy ever since Russia invaded Ukraine and everybody, including our European counterparts, recognized that you just can't rely too much on fossil fuels. And these two secular trends would contribute to invest in uh, investment. You know, think about upgrading the capital stock in the U.S. You know, you need a brand new capital stock for for auto plants, for example. Like, just take the example of Ford. Ford is um, transitioning toward um, clean energy cars, right? You you need a different kind of equipment to create that kind of cars. That's what I mean by upgrading the capital stock in the entire economy. So the investment needs uh, for, you know, for, for US firms to near shore, fence shore, offshore, whatever, uh, um, and, um, um, you know, upgrade capital equipments will all contribute toward higher investment needs. So that should overall drive uh, interest rate up the neutral rate of interest up, reversing this decade-long uh, secular trend of declining interest rates. That's my opinion. And the uh, Federal Reserve doesn't need to raise the uh, Fed funds rate much higher for the neutral rate to come up, right? Because I think in your projection, in, your, in the model that you've used, uh, Bloomberg is projecting 5.5% to be the terminal rate. Can you explain that? Yeah, so uh, the Fed... The Fed has, they, they consult a uh, range of optimal policy rules to come up with what is the sufficiently restrictive level of interest rate that could achieve the their dual mandate of full employment and price stability of 2% inflation target, right? And that policy rule is a function of uh, how far inflation has deviated from the inflation target of 2% and how far has unemployment deviated from the neutral natural rate of un unemployment, right? And so uh, putting in the inputs into this rule, we come up with 5.5% as the appropriate appropriately sufficient, I mean, basically the reaction function that the Fed has, not that it's truly sufficient, but that at least is the kind of reaction function that the Fed has followed in the last two years. This is not to say that I think this 5.5% uh, is the right thing to do. This is just my prediction of what the Fed will do. And I think they will hike one more time in July and uh, data uh, unemployment rate, if it evolves according to our forecast, then they won't hike in September. You you brought up the um, Infrastructure Act. So the uh, bipartisan infrastructure law signed in uh, 2021 uh, provides as much as 550 billion dollars in new spending uh, budget. Will that have short term impact on inflation? Meaning, could that have the potential of pushing up inflation, which may force the Fed to raise more than once? You know, the whole point of Infrastructure Act and the Inflation Reduction Act is to bolster the supply side of the economy over time. And with uh, larger supply capacity, that should bring down inflation. Well, at least that's the hope and the goal. But um, usually policy have unintended consequences. And in this case, I do think the unintended consequence is additional short-term pressure on uh, bringing inflation up. And the reason why is that, you know, Infrastructure bills are, 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 you know, gold standard for economists. We love infrastructure bills because that tends to make everybody more productive. But at a time when the economy is running at very high capacity and there's shortages and labor everywhere, if you introduce this additional demand via, you know, infrastructure bill, um, it actually worsens the shortages. And usually when, when you introduce 
uh, additional demand in an economy that's running up to its capacity. It is the prices that adjust, not the quantity or output. That's what economic theory would tell you. So I think the unintended consequence of the infrastructure bill is that it actually would boost inflation uh, in the short term, causing the Fed to have to do more and um, amplifying this boom and bust cycle in, in, in this um, economy. It, uh, what, what Do you have a, an outlook for inflation factoring yes. in the infrastructure bill? Yeah, so the Fed cor- currently forecasts the fourth quarter for this year core PC inflation to be 3.9%. Uh, we think that it would be at least 4% with a risk of going to 4.2%. And this is already factoring in, to, uh, factoring in you know, our outlook of goods disinflation. We do think because of our recession outlook, we do think that prices of goods are coming down. We see in various uh, high frequency indicators, such as card box shipments, freight car loadings, that uh, consumer demand for goods has tanked recently. And and so our 4% core PCE inflation outlook even factored that in, and we still see, you know, a higher than the Fed's inflation forecast. So I I, I, I do think that, um, yeah, the the uh, Biden's industrial policies did play a role in, in stoking high inflation. The Fed wants 2% for their core PC. That's their target. What needs to happen to the economy for that number to be realized? Yeah, Powell actually talked about this today in the ECB forum. Um, so I, I would uh, I would frame it in the way that Powell, Powell did, which is that you can think about the economy as having three K, uh, main components, goods, housing, and also services excluding housing. And with goods and housing, um, there are data, good data to suggest that both of them would be coming down. Goods disinflation has continued for six months now, and we're expecting used cars and new car prices to further go down. Um, Housing prices are also uh, most likely going down because uh, we do have data and new rents and those takes time to feed in into the BLS construction of CPI, which is, um, you know, has some methodological quirk such that it lags new rents by about six to 12 months. But it is the core services excluding housing, which comprise of 50% of the PCE index that hasn't budged at all, uh, even after 500 basis point of rate hikes. And this component of services is labor intensive, and it requires the labor market to soften. Um, currently, wages, nominal wages in the U.S. is running at a, about a, an underlying pace of 5%. And 5% uh, with productivity of about 1% uh, would means that productivity adjusted wages is still running at 4%, which is double the pace of the Fed's 2% target. So I, I see that the need for the labor market to really slow down, not just gradually slowing, but really sharply slow, slowing for wages to be consistent with a 2% inflation target. You brought up housing. Many people are predicting the housing market to soften even further than it has already. But if you actually look at the case Shiller home price index, it's been trending up ever since January. How can you explain this uptrend? Yeah. So I think that the, you know, housing is a local thing. It's There's no national housing market, right? All housing is local. And what happened in the US is that you have these major cities like New York, San Francisco, basically blue states from blue states, where uh, during the pandemic, they shut down everything. Everybody's working from home and offices or businesses were really depressed in these cities. And these cities also are places where prices came from historical highs. So these cities saw a decrease in home prices before any other cities. Now, the cities that that have been supporting housing price in this adjustment process and barely adjusted at all are places like Arizona, Las Vegas, uh, Colorado, in the Austin, Texas, and basically littered around the South Sun Belt and middle part uh, of the U.S. 
And recall that in 2008, I'm not saying that the, this housing uh, adjustment today is, is similar to 08, but I think there is a good parallel to the 08 in that even back then, uh, major cities saw the adjustment in prices earlier than places like Las Vegas and Arizona, these second tier cities. And I think to some extent, we are seeing that now that you know, the first wave to adjust are these major cities and tech uh, layoffs um, are uh, plateauing. You know, a lot of those layoffs happened late last year and now they're hiring again and a case could be made that the tech recession is over. But on the other hand, the troubles brewing with the Sunbelt cities are just starting. And I think, um, 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 so, so David, I'm an Airbnb host myself, and this okay, oh, interesting. I, and I host um, a, a house in the in the countryside, right? Um, okay. And what I noticed very alarmingly this year is that Airbnb bookings collapsed for myself, and I now I saw um, statistics showing that I'm not alone. That in fact, all these. Airbnb, uh, number of Airbnb uh, listings surged during the pandemic as people are working from home. They th- think they can move out to the countryside and enjoy the fresh air and buy a vacation house. And now they are experiencing this reckoning of a collapse in, you know, uh, short term rental. Uh, Was this uh, recently, uh, Anna? This year, it started this year, okay. but the data are really coming in now that it shows that this um massive decrease in bookings is happening all along these cities like Colorado, uh, South Carolina, Sunbelt cities. And so this is why I, and I, from my own personal observation, I'm also starting to see houses that were bought during the pandemic as a vacation house uh, coming back on the market as, uh, um, again, just as these you know, Airbnb revenues dried up for the owners. And so I, I think that there is a second wave of housing correction happening with the second tier, third tier cities. Where And these are the cities also that have booming employment during the pandemic with, you know, sub four, sub three unemployment rate. I think the, the um, you know, the reckoning is coming for these cities and we that's the driver. The driver of this recession would be the poorer households, the second tier cities. And I think the reason why people are so optimistic about no recession is because they're focused on signs of recovery in these wealthy white collar jobs, first tier cities. But what's happening is that these second tier, right, is they are deteriorating. Well, okay, so I, I understand that the case shiller is based on the uh, an aggregate of the biggest cities. But uh, it so it's not reflective of, of what you just described. But if I were just to take this index, for example, I've noticed a direct inverse correlation with the rise in the mortgage rates. And now that rates have somewhat stabilized and you're predicting um, one more rate hike and then possibly no more, could you make the argument that the housing market will also stabilize in the, ra- in the, in the, in the wake of um, interest rates not going up anymore? You know, mortgage rates, it's a function of long-term treasury yields, and a lot of things can affect the treasury yields, right? Even if the Fed is hiking, the long-term treasury yields could go down, as you can see, in the, like if people think there's a recession coming or global global uh, demand growth, like a China hard lending fears led people to uh, run to treasury yields, mortgage rates go down. So mortgage rates... Um, you know, don't necessarily react to uh, the Fed's interest rate alone. So one factor is where I see the long-term treasury yield going back up um, are two fundamental factors. Number one, I mentioned to you the R star, the neutral rate of um, interest rate, given the structural investment needs for supply chain, building up supply chain, resiliency, transition to green energy, and also the government debt that the U.S. government has a unsustainable, unsustainable trajectory of a fiscal path that um, federal debt to GDP ratio is about to reach 130 percent of GDP in 2028. Those should over time push up long term interest rates. So I think that I think that the troubles in the housing market is not over. It is not a one way down direction, straight down kind of situation. I think it's it's 
their local minimums and things improve a little bit and then resume going down. I think that's the trajectory. The, the, the Airbnb story is interesting. Um, I wonder how much of that is less of a function of housing, but more of a function of people spending less on discretionary um, things like leisure and travel. Actually, if you notice in the latest uh, CPI report from last month and the breakdown, airfare was one of the components that actually shrank by double digit percentages. So it seems that people are traveling less. Is that is that a seasonal thing? Well, it can't be. It's summertime <laughs> where people are just concerned about their, their money. I, I think it's, um, I mean, that's a very good observation. I think it's a, a lot of things. Um, the things that's not alarming is that if you you explain the collapse in Airbnb rental as, well, people are just um, uh, traveling more internationally after, you know, China shut down. And so less domestic travels. People are still spending, just not domestically. So that's the benign explanation of this whole thing. right? But nonetheless, that still does not take away from the fact that less Airbnb rentals, less domestic tourism effects have spillovers to local business, right? There's less tourist money coming in, less people buying the ice cream in the ice cream shop. Uh, that's why um, small businesses have uh, worse troubles. And, you know, already we're seeing bankruptcy rates shot up in the U.S. These are small mom and pops places that are seeing a shrinkage in demand. So, and, and then of course, there's um, another factor that could um, explain that Airbnb is, yeah, the, if you, the non-benign factor would be because people are becoming poor and people are more discerning about what they spend in. And I think there is a lot to, to support on, 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 in terms of this observation, because I, I do think, I mean, looking at the cash balance in people's bank account and just people being more worried about the outlook, when you see layoffs headlines everywhere, especially that so far the layoffs have been concentrated among white collars, higher educated, higher income people, those are the people who are splashing on, on domestic traveling last two years. And that's why many Airbnb had it so easy because you charge outrageous amount of money and these white collars who are so wealthy are do not even blink an eye and spending. And everybody is becoming you know more wary about splashing money around. Uh, this is from the uh, JCHS, the uh, Joint Center for Housing Studies from Harvard University. And they've examined that uh, between t 2019 and 2021, household formation averaged between uh, 2 million and 2.4 million per year. Uh, this was a higher level of household growth than the historical mean of 1.4 to 1.5 million. So basically, they've noticed that household formation and household growth has surged in recent years. Let's assume this trend continues. Will it have any upward pressure on housing? Well, I, I think that statistics is a bit uh, okay. deceiving. I think the surge in how, so I think structurally, let's go back before okay. to that 2019. The issue is this, that household formation has been under what should be warranted uh, given demographics uh, conditions. That's because since 2008, because of tightening standards of landing and building, um, the housing sector is underbuilt by, we estimate, about three to four million homes. And there are a lot of pent up demand for housing because of this, you know, uh, below historic rates of household formation. And the household formation you saw in 19 to 21 during the pandemic, I personally think it reflects more of people buying second homes or people just trying to, people who already have homes moving to, um, you know, rural area or you know, countryside because they can work from home rather than people who didn't have a home before and wanting to get in. Because honestly, things have become even more um, un un unaffordable thereafter. Yeah. Yeah, fair enough. I, I live in Vancouver, Canada. So yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> the king of unaffordable places. Oh boy. Uh, younger people like me have it tough. But um, all right, well, let's close off with the investor. Now people are wondering whether or not uh, everything we've talked about so far, including your outlook for a recession by the second half of this year, will have a negative impact on earnings. How do you expect uh, margins and earnings to uh, progress from here? 
Well, um, this is the place where uh, I would bring out our chief equity analyst, Gina Martin Adams' view. I think Gina's view is that the earnings have bottomed out uh, last the, at the end of last year, and that uh, earnings are, are not pricing in a serious recession thereafter. And one reason why that is, is that CPI is going down faster than PPI. PPI tends to be input prices. So it means that the margins are improving, that at the margins, firms' margins were at wor the worst uh, in the fourth quarter of last year. And from here on out, as the, you know, you know, it's it's getting better uh, from, from Gina's point of view. Oh, sorry, I reversed. It's PPI coming down faster than CPI. So it means that the margins are improving. Yeah. Okay. Well, uh, Anna, well, that was a very insightful uh, uh, discussion. Thank you very much for your time. Where can people learn more from you and from your work? Um, the best way to read our insight is to go on the Bloomberg terminal, type in B-E-C-O, B -E -C -O, go, and uh, subscribe to the U.S. Research. All right. Thank you very much, Anna, for your time today. I appreciate it.